morning. Good morning. How are you? Got about an hour left, so we're okay. There's no restraints here. We're okay. Man, just be comfortable. Uh, hold on, we title today. It's called a profile gone wrong. In the scripture, it'll be in 1 Samuel, the first chapter. Verses 9 through 18. Give me a second. You can get there if you like. But the three points today would be a sensor, a profile, and a friend of mine named Mo. That's going to be our third point. You guys are Holler out our motto, would you? Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want in my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll reiterate like last week, and, and uh, I told Melissa, I said, you did a great job. You know, everybody did a great job, you know, in the pastor's absence and Michelle's absence. We still have a wonderful service. Mm -hmm. yes. But we're glad y'all came back. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't want you to, Amen. I don't want you on no, no more uh, little vacations until oh. it's time. <laughs> so, but we had a good time. Let's start this out in my intro. I asked my, my class a question that I teach downstairs. And I asked him, I said, how can we diminish a stereotype? And just what exactly is profiling? I wanted to do a little studying about the matter to see what I could figure out. I found out that it's everywhere. In almost all statements and comments. To understand why it hurts is because anytime you group races or individuals together, and make a judgment without them knowing that is an example of stereotyping. Most common is racial, gender, culture, groups of individuals. But you see, they've been around so long that they have become a public belief about most individuals. So all of a sudden, the things we hear about certain groups or individuals almost relate to us as a belief system. But see, stereotypes are often confused with prejudice because like prejudice, a stereotype is based on assumption. Say like, give you a good example here. When you assume something, just by looking at it. You collect data. And that data is stored. And you hold on to it. You, you just almost made yourself to believe. You know, make it a belief system. It's kind of like talking yourself into it. But positive stereotypes, they point out positive assumptions based on their looks. It's like saying women are more nurturing than men. Italians are great cooks. There you go. But even though they're positive, it may seem complimentary, they can cause as much pain as negative. 
When people are stereotyped, they feel less like an individual and may even feel that they are not being given due credit. That puts us in groups. You know, when I look, when I look on the internet, I either look at different commentaries that I don't have, or I look at tools that I can't afford. <laughs> I look at cars that I can't buy. You know, it's just a big giant picture book to me. But I know somebody's back there taking data because I get pop-ups that I like. So I don't know how it works. I don't know that system. But whatever I look for, I get little side notes of it. It pops up and it'll draw my interest off my commentary to look over there and see what Sears has on sale. <laughs> That's what I'll do. But see, the setting for this book was 1 Samuel, and I'll read verses 9 through 18. It says, So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post on the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord in all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, have I spoken hitherto? Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And thy God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And he said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat. And her countenance was no more sad. Thy blessing to the reading and doing and hearing of his words. You see, a setting for this book. The book begins in the day of the judges and describes Israel's transition from a theocracy of being led by God to a monarchy led by a king. The book starts out about a Levite family going to Shiloh, which is a century lo located tabernacle that all the tribes of Israel could use, known as the House of Prayer. The Le this Levite family had issues, though. The head of this house kept up his devotions, even though they had issues. Even though Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are the ones chiefly employed in the service of the house of the God, of God, they were lustful men that conducted themselves in very bad ways. As Eli the high priest was growing older, they were called the sons of Belial. And that word Belial means worthless, reckless, and lawless. But, but look at this. Elkanah was the husband in this story. He needed his devotions and went there to sacrifice anyway. He didn't have no excuse not to go to Shiloh. He didn't care what man was doing at Shiloh. He knew if he sacrificed at that altar, he would be received. You see, a lot of times people don't need very much of an excuse not to go to church. But see, even if the priest wouldn't do his duty, Elkanah did his anyway. But you see, he needed Shiloh. 
His family was divided and full of guilt and grief. The root cause of this division was he married two women. It kind of mirrors Abraham's family, along with Jacob's. <coughs> you see, the problem was that two wives could never agree. And I mean, you know, if, if you thumb through the channels and look at reality TV, <laughs> polygamy is there. You can actually watch a show if you can bear that kind of thing. <laughs> but I can't watch it. <laughs> but it's there. You know, it's a harsh reality that it's there. But see, Penny, like Leah, was very fruitful and had many children, which you think she would be easygoing and thankful. But she was considered a second wife and less loved. You see, Hannah, like Rachel, was childless. Hannah was the other, the other wife. And like Rachel, she was child, childless, but very dear to her husband. So this man, Elkanah, is dealing with two women in two tempers. Penia became haughty and insolent. She became rude and disrespectful. When we become that way, we can't carry our blessings. See, she was blessed with the ability to have a lot of children. But her attitude didn't say that, did it? You focus on the big giant family picture. Everybody's smiling in the picture, but after the picture, Mama mean. <laughs> you, know? you see, that's that's a stereotype, isn't it? You see, you went and took this family picture, you got all dolled up, but after the picture was over, stay away from Mom. <laughs> you know, that's it's a reality. It's there. <laughs> So, but Hannah, even though she was barren, she was very afflicted and disconnected from the family. Elkanah was in trouble between these two wives. But regardless of the fact, it says again that Elkanah, the husband, he had a good attendance with his worship. And he always took his wives, in plural, his wives, with him along with their children hoping they would agree to at least worship together. <laughs> Listen to this quote. It says, if the devotions of a family prevail not to put an end to its divisions, don't let the divisions put an end to the devotions. There's another excuse that you might be looking for not to have your devotions. You see, devotions are going to put an end to your divisions. How can you divide yourself from the love of God? You know, in my class this morning, we talked about people being encouragers. That's what we have to be. We have to encourage people. One day at a time, one minute at a time, one second at a time. To make God's plan work. But you see, in their pain, he always had to lift one up and settle one down. It's pretty hard, isn't it? Uh, my friend Will, he's here today. And we work together. And, and there's a term I like to use when I go to work because we're a team of individuals. You know, when we're all in the same place, we're competitive. You know. We like what we do, picking up garbage. And like little kids, you know, the guy who can pick up the most, he's the best. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but when we come together, we feud about it. You see, Will works in the shop. And, you know, we all filter in by different times, and they have to have our trucks ready by a certain time, so we can leave on time. Well, there's another group of individuals. You got your seniors, you got your ones that haven't been mechanic in so long. And instead of being like this, they're like this. Because the new guy makes more money than the old guy. And then, so I looked at one of the old guys the other day. I said, would two more dollars really help you? I said, are you really going to change if they gave you more money? 
He didn't do it to me. He didn't do it to me. I just keep asking him the question, is it really going to change things? But anyway, he tried to really encourage him and stop Pena from the, from the harsh insults. But Hannah couldn't bear it. And she wept and did not eat. She almost stripped herself of the joys of God. She had a fretful spirit. Elkanah could not fix this. He was always searching for a very way to comfort his wife. When two are married, they become one. But sometimes they didn't have the same spirit. You know what I'll say. If she ain't happy, nobody's happy. Amen. <laughs> Quick fix, you gotta get this thing done. But see, even Hannah, you put yourself in her shoes, she knew her husband loved her. But even his encouragement could not comfort her. She couldn't get away from Penny's jeers and words that would erode her self confidence. You see, we can't keep people from criticizing, <coughs> but we can choose our way of retaliation. Is there a way of retaliation? Is there a good way of retaliation? We can turn around and give it to the Lord, like Hannah does. But rather than dwelling on the problem, we always have to remember our love and hope in God. We can exchange pity for hope. Romans 7, it talks about prayer, meditation, devotion, Bible study, spiritual discipline. But see, here's when the censor takes place. <clears throat> Hannah had a good reason to be and feel discouraged and bitter. She couldn't have children. She, she shared her husband with a woman who ridiculed her. Her husband couldn't solve her problem. And the high priest Eli didn't understand her motive. But she refused to give up or retaliate in a bad way. <clears throat> she brought her issue honestly before God. You see, we all face times of variance. It's not just in childbirth. Our work. Sometimes you go, you punch that clock, you're there for eight hours, and you feel like you've got nothing done. We, you know, we love Friday. You know, we do. But we ain't counting back 40. I don't want to get to Friday. I don't look back at Monday. It's over. Our service. We was talking about Thessalonians in my class, talking about our service and never having any really affirmation of it. But we get our affirmation from others. We're not a team of individuals. We're Christians. And it has to show in our relationships. Our relationships aren't barren. I mean, we do have friends that we just call friends, and we have friends. You know, that we can share things with that are in common. But see, here's the thing is, as Hannah prayed, Eli is a spy looking at her, seeing her lips moving, but not hearing any words. That's a censor. And censor means to examine a presentation in order to suppress and hold apart, to be considered obscene and unacceptable. He, he, he thought she was being unacceptable. He thought, she was drunk. In my opinion, the man of God kind of got in the way of things, didn't he? But you see, we have egos. Even as men of God, people of God, it don't matter. We are egotistical at times. You see, there's a part of the mind that's inaccessible to the conscious mind. But that affects behaviors and emotions. And then there's this thing called an ego. I'm not a psychologist by any means. But the part of the mind that meditates, that mediates, I mean, between the conscious and the unconscious, and is responsible for reality testing and a sense of personal identity. You see, I ran across words like hypothesis. And I don't know who put that word together. <laughs> But it means an educated guess. That don't sound right. An educated <laughs> guess. And then there was a one that said hypothetical. And it needs a scenario to go into. 
Let me explain a little more. Prayer is a presentation to God that it, you just can't see. But see, Eli is taking out of the presentation. He's recording that is what he's doing. And he takes it out of the picture and he stereotypes it. He makes a judgment without a knowing. You see, then he profiles it. When you profile someone, the data from your observation has to go somewhere, doesn't it? So you put it on somebody. That's how you make a stereotype. When you take your data and you observe it, then it goes to a certain kind of person. It, it, it stamps their characteristics, so to speak. So it stamps them with a behavior class. You know, like when I was a kid, I got stereotyped all the time. When it came to basketball, I didn't get picked. <coughs> when it came to football, they needed some protection. <laughs> so I got picked. You know? So I was kind of limited to box hockey and football. I could do that too. But see, you look at a profile, you think of something that's stamped is what you think of. And, it, and it's like a coin. And it leaves a raised profile on it. Like, like your money in your pocket. It's got a head of some president on it. But in Mark 12, 16, it says, they brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription in this? And it's Caesar's, they replied. Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. You see, and also there's another thing that Joseph had. He had a signet ring. And that ring, you know, when they put some hot wax on an envelope and they he put that ring on there, they know that that was Pharaoh's seal. But Joseph was doing business with somebody else's seal. His leader, upon his departure. You see, here's a story about my friend Moki. And, and he received a stereotype, mostly all his life. And see, he told me this story when I was a kid. It didn't come like this, but I wrote it like this, because now I understand what he was talking about. You see, Moki was slightly challenged, physically and also in speech. I'd see him around town walking or catching the bus somewhere. Moki would always stop and visit with everybody, but mainly the kids and the elderly. The people who could understand him or, or didn't have a stereotype yet. They haven't been collecting data very long where they figured out that data was useless. <laughs> but see, in town, there's a place called Jones and Sons Funeral Home. You could find Moki there. And I asked him, I said, why do you go to everybody's funeral? He told me that he could always hear a good sermon. And he said the preachers at a funeral, they wouldn't hold nothing back. They put in a little extra. And he would get to hear funny stories about the deceased person. And he got to wear a suit. Moki let me know he had five black suits. Because that's the only ones he wore, that's the only ones he bought. Because there was every now and then there was five saints. But the biggest thing is that the people around me wouldn't stereotype me. For my characteristics as being crippled, they would accept the love from my heart. So Moki would always put himself in that situation and he loved to go to a funeral because he could actually hug somebody without being judged. Amen. That was Moki's picture. And I mean, I didn't really understand it then. Because some of the parents would say, you need to stay away from Moki because we don't know about Moki. But that's where you could find Moki was at a funeral. But let me tell you this in closing. When 1 Samuel was written and the nation was going from a theocracy to a kingdom, Israel had more enemies than they had friends. You see, Samuel could pray just like his mother Hannah. But you've got to understand later on, Samuel anointed Saul and he also anointed David. You see, the book starts with just a, a family going to Shiloh. But in order, in Israel's first order and transition, the very first book's written about a praying mama. 
That's what the first book of 1 Samuel talks about. A woman praying. That's so one of the greatest prayer stories in the Bible. But see, prayer was instituted long before he was born. But God starts one of the most important books with that little old woman praying. Let me tell you something. Just as he started that book with a woman praying, on June 25, 1962, I wasn't around yet, but prayer was taken out of a New York school. The prayer read, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. That's what it says. But when prayer gets censored, when you take prayer out, it changes our profile picture. Doesn't it? Look how we look as a nation without it. Amen. You see, you, you start touching things that's things that God has instituted, it's going to change the profile picture. You see, it's, it's, it's one thing that God uses to make an impression felt through his people. The very Supreme Court made this decision about prayer, made another decision about marriage. I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to let that lie. But you see, our justices are removing the impressions that God instituted the profile of our country is starting to look a little different. Amen. Can I, I'll tell you this. Stereotypes separate us, and they put us in categories. But can I tell you one thing? You have been censored out of that worldly view. You've been censored with an impression to the Almighty God. They can take what they want. They can censor what they want. But like the pastor said a couple weeks ago, God is still at work. Yes. They can take what they want to take. But they can't take the impression that is on our hearts to live for Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, it says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Marvelous are thy, and that my soul knows it well. Praise the Lord. You're made to make an impression. You censor the things of the world and you take on Jesus Christ. And the first thing he says, pray without ceasing. Amen. You see, are, are you making that impression felt that you are the children of Jesus Christ. How well are you that stamp that has a raised profile for him? Here's a quote that I'll end on. And it says, Sometimes the heart sees what is invisible to the eye. That's awesome, isn't it? As people, we assume a lot. Eli assumed that Anna was drunk in the sanctuary, sanctuary. But he had two sons that worked in that sanctuary that were doing obscene things in that sanctuary. He was partial to them, but he censors or he stereotypes Anna. I just wanted to come by and tell you today that stereotypes hurt no matter how they are. As Christians, we shouldn't stereotype. All of us are fearful and wonderful made. And are to make an impression. You see, that's an awesome profile picture. I know there were some things done there. But you know, he died for us. We have to make that impression felt. Amen. Amen. Yes. We have to. So, that's all I got for you today. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. But put it in the shoe leather. Make it work. You know, don't just hear it. 
Make it work. And if it wasn't good enough, let me know. <laughs> I'll try to make it better next time. But thank you. And I thank the pastor for letting me pinch hit today. I had a good time. And I hope you enjoyed it. We did. Because I borrowed it from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you stand, I'll give you the benediction. And we'll dismiss. As we go out this week, put on a different pair of glasses. Amen. Look at everybody as Jesus Christ has looked at you. He didn't care what you did in the past. He wants to change your future. Don't let the course of history put a profile on people that can't be changed. Because we was all profiled. Jesus looked through his eyes and he said, they're all redeemable. For my work and purpose and love. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. <laughs>